In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, our one true God. Greetings, everybody. This is the second video on Roman Catholicism, a view of the true Orthodox, of the true Orthodox Church. In the previous video, we covered such topics as the filioque, papal supremacy, unleavened bread, clerical celibacy, Latin baptism, and purgatory. And that brings us chronologically to 1096. 1096. The Pope was urban. Pope Urban was reigning. So he gets the idea this is now 50 years after the Pope and the Latin Church was anathematized by the Eastern Church. All the Christians in the East. Now, Pope Urban decides that he is going to have a crusade. We're going to talk about the Crusades and here he is, he is a bishop. What business does he have to organize an army? He's supposed to be a bishop. Why does he want an army to go and fight? He's a bishop. He's supposed to be doing his prayers. He's supposed to be fasting. He's supposed to be living an ascetic life. He's supposed to be repenting. After all, it was just 50 years earlier that he should think to himself, look at that. All the Christians of the East have put a curse on me. Jerusalem, the Church of Antioch, the Church of Alexandria, the Church of Constantinople, the Church the Church of Russia, the Church of Greece, the Church of Bulgaria, the Church of Romania, they all consider me outside the church. Shouldn't I consider why did this happen to me? Should I reconsider my position? Why was I anathematized? No, 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 no. He doesn't think like that. He wants to raise an army. Why? Because he's not a bishop. He's more than a bishop. He's a secular ruler that has the facade of being a bishop. So he wants to raise an army from all the kings of Europe and send them to the Holy Land to liberate the Holy Land from the Muslims. Now, this is not the business of a bishop. The First Crusade, according to the definition that's commonly known, was the first of a series of religious wars initiated, supported, and at times directed by the Latin Church. And as I said, what business does a bishop have directing an army? Bishops don't do things like that. So he called for a holy war, and that's another awful expression. How, what can there, how can there be a holy war? A war is where you kill people. <clears throat> so they gathered what? 50,000, 60,000 troops, soldiers, infantrymen, and it was like four armies. They gathered together, four different rulers of their armies, and they headed, headed to Jerusalem. And to make people join the crusade, the Pope said, I will give you 
an indulgence which you cannot refuse. It's so good. If you die fighting in my crusade, I will guarantee you an indulgence that you go to heaven. If you live, I will give you an indulgence that you will not go into purgatory. What a win-win situation you have. Come on, join my crusade. And this is how he tempted people. Because after all, we just, we just made the doctrine of purgatory not too long ago. You have to believe it. After all, I'm an infallible pope, he would say. And that's how he got troops to join. And so what do they do? In 1096, they started, 1095, and they went to the Holy Land. They had success. If you call conquering land success, you know, this was a holy war. And you had these thousands of troops being blessed, being blessed by the Pope of Rome. Can he give a blessing? He's a heretic now. And what are the blessings of heretics? We know. You would expect the ultimate outcome is not going to be well. So they went on their way to Jerusalem and they had to fl go through Asia Minor and down and through Lebanon, what's now Lebanon, Syria. And they conquered Edessa. It would, took some time, but they conquered Edessa. And what did they do? The Muslims left and they set up their own kingdom. They put their own bishop. Did they put the Orthodox bishop back on his throne? No. They put a Latin bishop. And they put a Latin governor or king. So now the Pope has a country called Edessa. And they went down a little further and they conquered Antioch. Antioch, ancient Antioch. Did they give the churches back to the Orthodox? No, they did not. They put up a Latin bishop and put up a Latin king. And they started commemorating the Pope. And then they went down further and conquered Tripoli. And they made the country of Tripoli. Now we have three countries, Edessa, Antioch, and Tripoli, with Latin bishops, Latin kings, and the Orthodox thrown out of their churches. Now they went down to Jerusalem. And yes, they finally conquered Jerusalem. And they sacked the place. It's called the Sack of Jerusalem because these were a band of unruly soldiers. They did th dreadful things, atrocities. Jerusalem fell. And did they give Jerusalem back to the patriarch of Jerusalem? No, 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 no. They're going to put their own bishop and have their own kingdom and he's going to commemorate the Pope and that's the religion that they're going to have in Jerusalem. Can you imagine? And what did they do with the non-Christians? They massacred them. They killed all the non-Christians. What else? Everything, un every ungodly thing that you, unchristian thing, the rapes, the murders, but they got the kingdom, the kingdom of Jerusalem. 
and the Latins are now ruling there. This was their holy war, blessed by the Pope. How many people who are non-combatants were killed just because they were non-Christians? What kind of Christianity do these people have? They have the Christianity of the Pope. That's what they have. This is the First Crusade. The Second and Third Crusade wasn't very successful. Now we're going to talk about the Fourth Crusade, the infamous Fourth Crusade. With some background information first, in 1202 to 1204, this Crusade was called <clears throat> by Innocent the Third. The guilty Pope Innocent the Third saw that they had success in the First Crusade, but not completely, because they captured Jerusalem and then lost it. So now they want to recapture Jerusalem. So. The guilty innocent the third made a proclamation <clears throat> to all the kings and nobles of Europe, let's have another crusade. And they all agreed to gather in Venice and from there to be transported across the sea to go to Egypt. And when they land in Egypt, they will destroy the Muslims there and then march right across and recapture Jerusalem. That was the plan. <clears throat> but with the blessing of Pope Innocent the Guilty, it didn't work out well. What kind of blessing can a pope give you? Remember now, these people have been outside of the church. They left the Orthodox Church for 150 years now. In 1202, the Crusader army gathered in Venice. However, only 12,000 men arrived, as opposed to the expected 35,000 thousand soldiers. The Venetians had made preparations to transport more than 30,000 men, and they wanted full payment before transporting the crusaders across the sea. So who came? About 5,000 knights, 8,000 infantry, 300 siege weapons, 10,000 soldiers and uh, uh, 60 war galleys and 100 horse transports, 50 troop transports. But that wasn't what the Venetians had prepared for. And they wanted full payment of all the preparations they made, or else, I don't care. If you're a fellow Latin and obedient to the Pope, we're not going to do anything unless you pay all that you ordered. When the Crusaders couldn't pay the money, the Venetians instead asked them to attack the city of Zara the port city that competed with Venice for commerce. So the Crusaders said, oh, this port city is a Christian city. They belong to the Pope too. But who cares? They said. We're talking about money now. So the Crusaders attacked the Christian city the Latin Christian city of Zara. 
and pillaged it. Who knows how many people were killed? So the Venetians couldn't get the balance that they needed or that they wanted to transport the Crusaders across the Mediterraneans. The Venetian fleet was led by Dog Enrico Dandolo. And for brief, we'll call him Dog. Dog was in no hurry as he planned to stay in Zara after he pillaged and destroyed it for the winter. Zara fell on November um, 24, and the Venetians and the Crusaders sacked the city before they continued on their way to Egypt, supposedly. Dog had correspondence with the Byzantine Emperor Alexios Angelos, who was a traitor. He said to him, I am I'm deposed from being the emperor, but if you could divert divert your crusaders, come over come over here and reinstate me with your power. <clears throat> I will become I will be become a Roman Catholic. I will renounce my orthodoxy and become a Roman Catholic and I will give you more money to pay the Venetians. And so the crusaders said, "Ah, oh, okay. Let's go to Constantinople instead of Egypt." And when they came to Constantinople, they saw the most beautiful Christian city in the world, the biggest Christian city in the world. And they were truly Christians. They were Orthodox. They weren't Latins. So they decided, why should we go to Egypt? Look at this place. It's got so much wealth. Let's attack this place and destroy it. <clears throat> and so that's what they did. After all, these are Latin Christians. Crusaders are Latin Christians. The Byzantine only had the Byzantines only had ten thousand infantry and um 5,000 foot soldiers in the city to defend it with 20 war galleries. They tried to defend the city, but they were overpowered by the Latins. The Latins set the city on fire and attacked the city and did the most horrible things that even the pagans, that would rival even the pagans. What followed was one of the most profitable and disgraceful sacks of a city in history. Despite the oaths that the crusaders made and the threat of excommunication, the crusaders ruthlessly and systematically violated the city's holy sanctuaries, destroying, defiling, stealing all that they could lay their hands on. Many broke their vows with respect to women, the women of Constantinople, and assaulted them. Here is how Sir Stephen Runciman, a noted historian, talks about the sack of Constantinople. The sack of Constantinople is unparalleled.
paralleled in history. For nine centuries, the great city had been the capital of Christian civilization. It was filled with works of art that had survived from ancient Greece with masterpieces of its own exquisite craftsmanship. The Venetians indeed knew the value of such things. Wherever they could, they seized treasures, carried them off to adorn the squares and churches and palaces of their own towns in Venice and surroundings. But the Frenchmen and the Flemings were, fi were filled with the lust for destruction. They rushed in a howling mob down the streets, through the houses, snatching up anything and everything that glittered and destroyed whatever they could to carry, pausing only to murder or to rape or to break open the wine cellars for their refreshment. Neither monasteries nor churches nor libraries were spared. Saint Sophia itself in the great church. Drunken soldiers could be seen tearing down silk hangings and pulling the great silver iconostasis to pieces, while sacred books and icons were trampled underfoot. These are supposed to be Christians, crusaders, with the blessing of the Pope, while they drank merrily from sacred altar vessels, they put a prostitute and sat her on the patriarchal throne in the holy church of Hagia Sophia. And they began singing awful songs in the holy church. Nuns were ravished in their convents, palaces, and small places alike were all entered and wrecked. Wounded women and children lay dying on the streets. For three days, the ghastly scene of pillage and bloodshed continued until the huge and beautiful city was a shambles. Even the Saracens would have been more merciful, cried the historian Nikitas with, with truth. They destroyed the greatest city of the Christian Empire, Constantinople, the biggest city, the holiest city. You can imagine how many holy things were there and where are they now? Oh, they went to the Catholic Latin West. Ah, the doors, even the doors of Hagia Sophia, beautifully carved doors, very big. They took them off the hinges and they transported them to Rome. <clears throat> to be used? No. There's no place that could use such big doors. After all, they came from St. Sophia in Constantinople. So where are they now? They're just on the side, leaning up against the wall in St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. These are the, these are the spoils of war. And we have a picture of them. What was the outcome? How many people were killed with the blessing of the crusaders in Constantinople? 
The Byzantine Empire was left much poorer, smaller, and ultimately less able to defend itself against the Muslim conquests that followed. The actions of the Crusaders thus directly accelerated the collapse of Christendom in the East and actually facilitated the Ottoman conquest of Southern Europe. All the stolen artworks, the gold, the relics, the holy objects. Oh, they say, we're sorry. Even now, they say, oh, we're sorry we took them. But don't even imagine we're going to give them back. Oh, no, 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 no. What kind of Christians? What kind of Christians are they? What kind of Christians are they that would attack a Christian city? All right, we know they're heretics, but don't they have any conscience? Is that what happens when you become a heretic? Yes, indeed, that is what happens. There's no fear of God. You are not a Christian indeed. You take the Holy Scriptures, you just throw it out the window, and you act like a pagan, a Latin pagan. The popes, they saw, look what we did. We got away with, with destroying the city of Zara, we got away with destroying the city of Constantinople. We're killing people, and we're getting away with it. So let's have a crusade to the west of us, because there's some heretics over there, and the easiest way to get rid of them is to kill them. So they had a crusade against the heretics of Spain after they destroyed Constantinople, killed and raped and, and, and destroyed so much. They said, look, we could get away with more. Let's have an inquisition. Let's start an inquisition. So what is it, about 20 years later, they started this horrible papal tradition. Inquisition was a group of institutions within the Catholic Church whose aim was to combat heresy. Heresy was not believing in the Pope. Here's heretics fighting heretics, conducting trials of suspected heretics, but convictions of unrepentant heresy were handed over to secular courts, which generally resulted in execution, execution or life imprisonment. So now we start with the blessing of the Pope, this horrible institution of the Inquisition. Now who knows how many people that destroyed? This is where Catholicism leads. So the question was, how many people were destroyed? Or rather, shall we say, more accurately, how many people were murdered? Remember, the Inquisition was a powerful office set up within the Roman Catholic Church to root out and punish heresy, or, to be more precise, those who did not believe the way the Pope wished. And this Inquisition spread throughout Europe and the Americas. Who did they kill? Who did they torture? Jews, Muslims, and non Latin Christians. 
the worst manifestation was in Spain, where the Spanish Inquisition was a dominant force for more than 200 years. Can you imagine living in such a society that if you didn't think right, you could be, you could be executed? And the estimates were the conservative 32,000. Ah. But other estimates, because who knows, the, Inqu the Spanish Inquisition blessed by Sixtus, the Pope, a Pope, an infallible Pope, authorized the Spanish Inquisition in 1478. And the estimates range up to 300,000. And some historians are convinced that that's not an accurate number. It's in the millions were murdered by the Roman Catholic Church. And how were they punished, one may ask, in a very gruesome gruesome way. After they were killed, their bodies were burned in public. When they were living, they were publicly tried and then tortured for several hours. Some were burned at the stake. Yes, that's the more well-known Spanish punishments. Others were forced to be become galley slaves or returned back to prison for more torture. What was the torture? Starvation. Oh. Is that all? No. Burning coals were put on parts of the body. And what else? Slow impaling. Slow impaling. How, how can... How can Christians, they call themselves Christians, how can they do such a thing? What justification do they have to do such a thing? So how long did this last? It started in 1231, 1229. Pope Gregory the Ninth kept on going for hundreds and hundreds of years. This, so there's no telling how many people were murdered. And some say in 1808, Napoleon, when he conquered Spain, he issued a direct order. Inquisitions are to stop. But no, 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 no. They didn't stop. They continued. Queen Maria Bourbon decreed in 1834 inquisitions are now illegal. Did that stop? No, 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 no. They just kept on going. And some say that in 1945, at the end of World War II, the Inquisitions stopped. Why? What happened there? Well, at the end of World War II, when Germany lost, and the Ustashi in Croatia, along with Hitler, Hitler were defeated, they found out that they had killed conservative estimates. 800 thousand Orthodox Serbian Christians. Orthodox. And of course, don't forget, this was done by Roman Catholic clergy. Participation. Blessing of their bishops, their cardinals, and yes, their wretched Pope Pius, what is he, the 12th. They had concentration camps. The Orthodox Christians were rounded up like an inquisition. I said, now, 
We know you people are orthodox, but in our estimation, you are heretics. So, in our estimation, you're not allowed to live. But if you want to live, commemorate the Pope. Join the Roman Catholic Church. Let us baptize you in the Latin way. And so many people refused, and they were murdered. And where did this Inquisition go? It killed Jews, it killed Muslims, it killed Spanish heretics, it killed, no, I shouldn't say killed, murdered, Protestant reformers that was in the Roman Inquisition. Then there's the Mexican Inquisition in South America, the Peruvian Inquisition, the Portuguese Inquisition, the Goya Inquisition in India. Even in India, they had an Inquisition. They were murdering people in India. The Brazilian Inquisition, it goes on and on and on, and you could say the country of Serbia was subject to this. Why? Because the impious Pope Pius XII wanted to have a utopian Catholic country, a utopian Roman Catholic country where everybody in the country is a Roman Catholic. So right across the water was Croatia. The only problem was there were millions of Orthodox Christians there. Well, the solution for them, murder them. And that's what they did. So there's no way we could talk about the Inquisition without talking about the ungodly genocide of the Serbian Orthodox people in the 1940s. And they killed, well, they murdered. They murdered 800,000 true Orthodox Christians. Because at that time, the Serbian church was a true Orthodox church. And they did it in the most sadistic way, taking pleasure in brutality, with savage, inhumane viciousness. There's no words I can describe how horrible they were. And they even took pictures of their atrocities. Uh, we could show them, but it would make people very sick. And why did they do that? Speculation. Then send back to Pope Impius XII to show them the work of his Franciscan monks in Croatia. Sad. What kind of people, what kind of people are these that call themselves Christian? The Eustachi planned, with the help and approval of Pope Impius XII, to exterminate the Serbian people from Croatia. And one-third, the plan was to kill, to kill one-third of them. And one-third, they will expel them. And one-third, they will forcibly convert to the Roman Catholic Church. And what kind, what kind of justification do they have? Well, after the Inquisition started, they had the Aristotle of the Middle Ages, a person called Thomas Aquinas, a real character, whom the Roman Catholics love to say is a saint. But in the opinion of the true Orthodox, the person is a crackpot. Because what does he say? He made the Summa Theologica. 
and Aquinas calls the summit of theology. In it, he may have said some logical things, but in it he also said, in Article 3, whether heretics ought to be tolerated. She says, Christ said this, the Apostle Paul agreed with Christ, and he said that, that, they, that heretics must be tolerated. Then he said, but I say, but I say, as if he's some kind of authority? Yes, to the Roman Catholics, he is an authority because he justified the Inquisition by saying, I answer, there is the sin whereby they deserve not only to be separated from the church by excommunication, but also to be severed from the world by death. This Aquinas says, because they sin, because they are not Roman Catholics, that's a sin. And they have to be separated. They cannot only be separated from the church by excommunication, they have to be separated from the world by murder. And again, he says, for heretics, as soon as they are convicted of heresy, to be not only excommunicated, but even put to death, quote, unquote. He says it in his theological works. Christ says, love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you. But Thomas Aquinas says, no, I know better. Persecute, persecute them and murder them. The gospel according to Thomas Aquinas. On the part of the church, however, there is mercy, he says, he continues, which looks to the conversion of the wanderer, the heretic. Wherefore, she condemns not at once, but after the first and second admonition, taking St. Paul's words and twisting them like you can't believe, as the apostle directs. After that, Aquinas says, if he is yet stubborn, the church, no longer hoping for his conversion, he's speaking in behalf of the church. Who does he think he is? The church, no longer hoping for his conversion, looks to the salvation of others by excommunicating him and separating him from the church. And furthermore, delivers him to the secular tribunal to be exterminated, to be exterminated, thereby from the world by death. You've got to exterminate people. He's saying who, after the first and second admonition, they don't believe you. Kill them. Article 4 of the same Summa La Theologica, crazy book which the Roman Catholics love, and Aquinas calls the summit of theology. Whether the church should receive those who return from heresy. Again, quote, the Aristotle lover. Thomas Aquinas says, but when they fall again, when they go back into heresy, he's saying, after having been received, this seems to prove them to be inconstant in faith. Wherefore, when they return again, they are admitted to, to penitence. But are not delivered from the pain of death. Oh, so they repent, you give them a penance, but still they have to be put to death. They're not delivered from the pain of death. 
But the church cannot imitate God in this. Who does he think he is? Aquinas saying the church cannot imitate God in this? For she permits those who have relapsed after being once received are not sincere in their return. Hence, she does not debar them from the way of salvation, but neither does she protect them from the sentence of death, from the se sentence of lawful murder. How can there be a lawful murder? Well, if you believe in the Inquisition that was happening at that time, Aquinas says, kill them. He was next up in his brain. He was a lunatic. How can a Christian say, Christ says this, St. Paul agrees, but I say this. So listen to me. This man was so full of pride, he wreaked it in his words. Now how did this man die? He was riding his donkey on the Apia way, on the way to Lyon for the Second Council of Lyon. And he was probably reading Aristotle. He should have been reading the Gospel. But he passed underneath a tree and it hit him in the head, knocked him off his donkey. And I think after he was convalescing for a few days, he said, everything I wrote is straw. Now, what is straw used for? It's to be burned. So maybe he was enlightened to think that the Summa Theologica is worthless. And a few days later, the swelling in his brain would not cease, and he died. Now, enough about the Inquisition. But Roman Catholics should have this as proof, a visible, historical, and established proof that this sanctioning of murder under the name of Inquisition, it should be proof that these people are not Christians, that the Roman Catholic Church is not the Church of Christ. It's a killing. It's a killing machine. Who can debate the fact that it is an institution that could kill you? So we must ask ourselves, why did all of this happen? Well, I think it's because the Latin Church has delved wholeheartedly into scholasticism. Thomas Aquinas was a scholastic. He used Greek philosophers instead of the Holy Fathers as guides. Scholastics need a rational explanation for everything. They think man can, by his own reason and intellect, understand, investigate God, or know what is right from wrong. But as we see, it was a failure. It led to the Inquisition. Instead of looking towards the Holy Fathers of the Church, and how they taught theology as apophatic theology, recognizing the limits of human nature and approach God with humility. 
saying, we cannot say what God is, but we can generally describe what he is not. But not so the scholastics, not so Thomas Aquinas. What did he think? <clears throat> he used Aristotle to validate his arguments, whereas the Holy Fathers deprecate scholastic system as useless tools for salvation. But Aquinas considered Aristotle to be foundational to intellectual and spiritual development. This is why we have the three pillars of orthodoxy here next to us. You would think that if they read the Holy Fathers of the Church and cast Aristotle and Plato out the window, they would understand Christianity. But no, they took the gospel and threw that away and went with the scholastics of the, the Greek pagans. Disgusting. What else was happening in the 1100s at the start of the Crusades? The Knights Templar Organization was started, and it was a Roman Catholic military order, one of the wealthiest and most popular military orders of the Latin Church. They were founded in 1119 and existed for nearly two centuries and they were officially endorsed by the Roman Catholic Church. So, the Roman Catholic Church had an army or had a military contingent of knights. Can you imagine? What does, what does a church need an army for? Its own personal army. Of course, all this is against the canons and against the law of God. But what does the Pope care about the law of God? If he disregarded the gospel, that means he thinks that he is above God. Around 1300s, Pope Boniface VIII issued Unma Sanctum, a papal bull, a papal bull that was issued on, in November 1302 and laid down the dogmatic propositions on the unity of the Catholic Church, that it is necessary to belong to the Latin Church for eternal salvation. You must believe the position of the Pope as supreme head of the Church and the duty thence arising for everybody to be in submission to the Pope, to belong to the Latin Church and thus attain salvation so this decree was issued in 1302 that you had to be a Roman Catholic and you had to believe in the Pope and you had to believe in this bull and truly it was bull. Now all religions have some kind of supernatural occurrences which deceive people to be convinced in their false beliefs. Now, for example, the Hindus have statues of a stone elephant, the god of wisdom, that drinks milk by a spoon right up the trunk of this 
elephant. And the Hindus, they see that and they said, that's it. We're salt. This is the true religion. Look at that. This stone is drinking milk. We have the true faith. The Buddhists, they levitate. Oh yeah, they levitate. They walk on hot coals. They run on top of water. They meditate in boiling water and in the cold and freezings. And they have, et cetera, et cetera. And well, you know, what do you know? They're sold. They're convinced. Look at that. This is our religion. Look at this happenings that we have. The Muslims, they slash themselves, beat themselves to cover themselves with blood, celebrate their, their festivals. They have an evil eye curse that works. So uh, they have genies that animals see and freak out. And beside that, we have two billion people out, and they say, we have the faith. They're sold on it. They're never going to leave Islam. And now we come to the Jews. What did the Jews say? The Jews, after being a vagabond nation for killing their Messiah, for killing God, and then casting away the Septuagint, Old Testament scriptures, and making their own scriptures, the Talmud, they say, look at that. After all of that, Israel is black. We have a country. We have a country. It doesn't matter. We don't have a temple, we don't have sacrifices, we don't have miracles, we don't have prophets, but we're going to get a Messiah. And yes, some people call him the Antichrist, but everybody is going to be obedient to him. <clears throat> so we are sold. We are not leaving Judaism or the state of Israel. That's what they say. The Coptic monophysites, these so-called Christians, they see an apparition of the Virgin Mary on top of a Coptic church, and they say, that's it. We have the true faith. We're sold. No debate. The Protestants, what do the Protestants have? The Protestants have demonic, they speak in, in tongues the, uh, through the help of the demons, all types of gibberish. They slap you in the face and the demons leave. Unleavened. They hold and handle poisonous snakes and they say, ah, oh, look at that. Look at these supernatural occurrences. We have the true faith. We're sold. No way are we going to change. Now we come to the Roman Catholics. And now this can be a big stumbling block for many Roman Catholics. But if we see that they have the same demonic experiences as all the pagans, they have statues that drink milk just like the Hindus. They have statues that weep and bleed. They have people that have stigmata. They have people who have the stigma of the stigmata. Can you imagine? They have unleavened bread that turns to flesh. That's it. They're sold. They believe, and there's no one going to change them because... They're convinced by the supernatural things, but they don't realize that the demons, all of these people, all of those religions, you could lump them all together. They don't realize that the demons can deceive and do deceive 
human beings and make you believe something that you do not even see. Remember, Simon Magus, who was, com who was debating, debating the apostle Peter in Rome. What happened to him? The demons were going to show how great a person he was and how he was going to fly. And so they actually picked him up and flew him through the air. Then the demons let go. Maybe St. Peter made the sign of the cross. Mm -hmm. But the demons let go and bang, he came down, dropped like a, like a rock, and that ended his, eventually ended his life. So, we are not to trust these super natural appearances because they don't they don't prove anything they are a spectacle demonic um, apparitions miracles are just a spectacle we know from the lives of the saints and especially saint saint Pahomius the great that the demons have the power to do this through the abandonment of God. The Orthodox Christians do not accept miracles, supposed miracles, that happen to other religions that confirm them in their error. How can you accept that? God will not work a miracle to keep you outside the church. If God is going to work a miracle for you, no matter what religion you are, it's going to be a miracle to draw you to orthodoxy, to draw you to the one true church that Christ made. Now, in the church, we have experience of both the good and the evil, about the demonic and the angelic. We in the church, because we have the experience of the lives of the saints, we can discern what is from the devil and what is from Christ. We who are in the church, because we have the grace of God, because we have the Holy Spirit, are not deceived by the tricks of the devil. So we do not fall. The church doesn't fall into deception like all the rest of the religions do. And this is a major hallmark of true religion, true orthodoxy. Now the Roman Catholics have many of these occurrences, many, Fatima, Lords, you name it, to asking for the conversion of Russia. What does Russia have at that time? 78,000 churches. The whole country is practically orthodox, and the demons are asking for the conversion of Russia to Roman Catholicism, the demons are asking from the Fatima uh, visions and lords that they want Russia to convert and be dedicated to the sacred heart of Mary. What kind of talk is that? So things that are so obvious, these, it's like Russia is, is Christian. The Latins are heretics. And you think the Virgin Mary is saying, I want the Orthodox Christians of all Russia to convert to heresy? There's some things that are obvious that you cannot accept. Now we have to say a statement that was, which is absolutely true. And it's going to be hard for people to accept. But Christianity teaches. The Orthodox Church teaches 
that heretics do not have grace. Heretics do not have the mysteries. Heretics do not have saints. So-called Roman Catholic saints are not saints. These so-called saints, after they left orthodoxy, are not considered saints. We don't have icons of them. We don't have services for them. We don't make prayers to them. There's no offerings to them in supplication because they died outside the church. And this is the teaching of the church. This is the teaching of the holy canons and the teaching of the holy fathers. Heretics are outside and have no part of the truth, no part of the church. They're alien to the church, and they fight against it just by their existence. We talked about the Crusades, the Inquisition, Serbian genocide. We talked about Thomas Aquinas and the scholastics. We talked about the Knights Templar, the personal army of the Pope, and the papal bull of Boniface. All must be Roman Catholics for salvation. And we talked about demonic appearances and miracles. We cannot talk about all the Roman Catholic errors and demonic happenings. If we were to do this, this video would go for hours. From the Immaculate Conception Theory and the, and the Pope's Gregorian calendar. How many people died just because they resisted the Pope's calendar change? All the foregoing that we've recorded on these two videos are all tremendous mistakes because they left the church. And we continue, if we talk about original sin, a Latin misconception, or if we talk about irresistible grace, compulsory grace, another Latin misconception and error, or if we talk about the wretched idea of predestination, another Latin error in thinking. Or if we talk about the idea of created grace, another Latin invention. All of these are completely crazy ideas that the demons invent. So all of these topics show that when you leave the church, you fall into error upon error. And the tradition that you adopt, it's, it's not a tradition that doesn't change, just like the faith is supposed to never change. No. Their faith is constantly changing, and the way they do things is constantly changing. Everything started to deteriorate after, 1, 000, after the year 1054. They left the church. So now we're going to end this video by asking questions which will exhibit other bizarre facets, characteristics of Roman Catholicism.
the papacy that should raise questions in someone's mind. Now we come to the end of this video. And what have we done with these two videos on Catholicism? We have just documented their own destruction because they did this to themselves by leaving the church. And when you leave the church, what good, what possible good can come from it? So now these are questions which we should ask ourselves. If you're a Roman Catholic, think about things like this. And there are a number of questions None of these questions are in any particular order. The first question is this, a quick recap. If the papacy is the church, why did they change the creed? Why do they think the pope is infallible? Why do they use unleavened bread? Why do they not permit their clergy to marry? Why do they believe in such a thing as purgatory? If the papacy is a church, why did they start crusades and the Inquisition? And why did they participate in the genocide of the great Serbian Orthodox people. If the papacy is a church, why did they fall into scholasticism? If the papacy is the church, why are they absolutely forbidden from receiving the holy fire miracle in Jerusalem every Holy Saturday. If the papacy is the church, why is it the richest entity on the earth? If the papacy is a church, why is the wealth of this group a secret? If the papacy is the church, why do they have their own bank? If the papacy is the church, why do they need their own state called the Vatican, a completely independent state? If the papacy is a church, why in the world do they wear yarmulkes, which is Jewish? Is it because the Jesuits were founded by someone who is Jewish? If the papacy is the church, why are the clergy clean-shaven? Is it because they want to emulate the glory of Rome under Caesar, who was clean-shaven? If the papacy is a church, why do do they not have icons, but rather prefer statues, like the pagans, which of course is against the rules of Christianity. If the papacy is a church, why do they have such a reverence for the Greek philosophers of paganism? If the papacy is the church, why do they have an obelisk right in the middle of St. Peter's Square, which is a Masonic symbol? Is it because all false religions, paganism, masonry, Catholicism, they're all connected to each other? Did you know that when the Pope wanted to put this obelisk I think it was from Egypt, in St. Peter's Square, that the person who was in charge of doing it, if he broke it, he would lose his life. 
threatened by the Pope. If the papacy is the church, why are there so many Orthodox saints, true saints, who said that the Pope is the forerunner of Antichrist? If the papacy is the church, why do the Latins demand that their services are only in Latin? Did the apostles go out and preach to the nations in Latin? Or did they preach in a language that all the people, no matter what language, would understand? If the papacy is the church, why do their clergy have a long historical record of immorality? If the papacy is the church, why do they not punish their clergy who have been found guilty of immorality and pedophilia? If the papacy is the church, why did they have such a close cooperation with the Nazis. If the papacy is the church, why do their doctrines, why do their traditions continue, continuously change? If the papacy is the church, why did they corrupt the ancient tradition of a prayer rope and make it into a rosary? And instead of praying the Jesus prayer to our Lord Jesus Christ, they prefer to pray to the Virgin Mary. If the papacy is the church, why, when they make their cross, they do it backwards, where we go to the right, where the good thief went to heaven, and they go first to the left, where the thief who went to hell. If the papacy is the church, and all their clerics and their monastics have to be celibate. Why are they so obsessed with sex? If the papacy is the church, why do their clergy not continuously encourage their parishioners to read the gospel, to read the scriptures? If the papacy is the church, why did they have to create the Uniat Church? Of course, it's only to deceive the Orthodox so they could be subject to the Pope. So we will end this video and say again that Christ only made one church for the salvation of of the world, and that is the Orthodox Church of the East. And as proof that this is the Church and not the Latin Church, I'm going to quote St. Vincent of Lorraine, a Western saint who gave like a formula for everyone in the future to understand where, where the Orthodox Church is. And he says, the church takes all possible care to hold that faith which, in the strictest sense, which was believed everywhere, always, and by all. And you cannot say that the Latin church fits that formula. But you can absolutely say that the Orthodox Church, the true Orthodox Church, not the ecumenists of world orthodoxy who have now entered into the ecumenical heresy, but the true Orthodox. We hold the faith which was everywhere believed, always and by all. May the Lord God enlighten all those who have taken the time to listen to this video series. God bless you.